This is chapter 108 of the Holy Quran and its title is Qasr, Abundance of Good and its translation is Surely we have given you an abundance of good. So pray to your Lord and sacrifice. Surely your enemy is cut off. In today's khutbah, I want to address an issue that is generally raised and that is that the Holy Quran does not have any sequence. There is no link between its various chapters. So it is thought. And this problem arises from the fact that we fail or people fail to understand the object of Holy Quran's revelation. You see, whenever you have a book or a subject, then you keep in mind what the objective of preparing that book or that topic or that subject is and the material you then have in it, you arrange with that objective in mind. Let's take the example of uh, history. Now, if you're writing a book on history, then you want to trace the, the timeline, the chronology of a king, of a dynasty, or an event. So you have to trace the important events in that king's life, in that dynasty's life, otherwise the book won't make sense. The same applies to a story. It has to have a timeline. This happened, that happened, that happened, that happened. Although sometimes to make things interesting, you can reverse that timeline. Talking about stories, let's take the example of who done it. Generally, you have some sort of a crime or a killing or whatever, and then the you know someone finds a body, and then detectives set about. Uh, trying to find who's killed that person um, and at the end you find out who it is who killed that uh, person and perhaps why. But sometimes you actually start the story in reverse and you know who has committed the crime or who has committed the murder and then the story is about how that person is arrested or found out. So, you actually reverse the, the timeline or whatever it is that uh, uh, you, uh, whatever it is that's going to happen at the end happens first and then you go back. But all of these things have a purpose, an objective. And that's why you do it. Now, if you have a book of history where you reverse the sequence when you're describing the history of a dynasty or, or, or a king, uh, it won't make uh, sense. But then there are other subjects which are not written in a chronological se sequence. For example, if you have a book on physics, it won't necessarily start with who came up with what law first. The book on physics, if you're doing GCSE physics, it will be divided into sections, different sections, and then maybe in those sections you, you'll get a chronology, but you may not even get that. 
if you're doing algebra or, 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 or calculus or something else, then what will happen is that you will simply uh, be reading or understanding some concepts and how to apply them in real life. So, in all of these things, it is the objective that is important and it is that objective that is kept in mind in the way the book is uh, written or devised, uh, etc. Now, Holy Quran is not a book of history. It is not trying to describe to you how the world was created. You see, the Old Testament is different. It is a little bit like the history of early humanity. So, it starts off with God creating the earth and then carries on from there. The Gospels, the New Testaments, they are all also historical books because what they are doing is they are describing to you the timeline in Jesus' life what his ancestry was, when he started, what he did and how he died, what happened after that and then they come to an end. Again, this is what Muslims say that the difficulty with the Old Testament and the New Testament is that you actually have to try and find guidance in them for humanity, how human beings are supposed to live and what they are supposed to do, what the relationships with each other should be. Now, the Holy Quran is actually a book of guidance. It is not a book of law that you find statutes in it. It is not a book of history that there should be a chronology and it should say on the 1st of September year whatever this happened and then uh, on the 9th of November year whatever this happened etc. And really with the chapter that we that, that, that I read out called Al Qasr the abundance of good, it is beginning to summarize the guidance that has been given. And God is telling humanity that in this book that has been revealed, the Holy Prophet or the humanity through the Holy Prophet Muhammad has been given an abundance of good, which is contained in the instructions and in the guidance that is in this book. And it that then compares what God can offer you and what human beings can offer you. Because if you go to the next chapter, next chapter is called the disbelievers, Al Kafirun. And in that, God compares what He has given us with what human beings can give us, those who want to take us away from the path of righteousness. And this relates to the time when uh, the Quraysh of Mecca were trying to stop the Holy Prophet Muhammad from preaching his message. So, they went to him and what did they offer him? They offered him everything that a human being would seek. They offered him everything that a human being can provide another. So, they said to him, Okay, what is it that you want? If you want power, we will make you our king. If you want wealth, we will give you all the treasures of Arabia. If you want women, we will give you the most beautiful, as many women as you want. Now, only these things are within the power of human beings to grant someone else. Even nowadays, 
we have elections when we bestow power upon the politicians who then go and run our country. And this is, the God, God is comparing two things. I'm giving you an abundance of good which is for you in this world and in the hereafter. But what human beings can offer you is only things of this world. And that, then the Holy Prophet replies and he says that uh, I serve not that which you serve. And that is that I don't seek things of this world. I do not worship this world. I have no need to seek after things which are regarded highly in this world, which is that you are powerful, which is that uh, you have lots of money, which is you have beautiful women. I don't seek them, because serving the world would be to seek these things. And then he says to them, nor do you serve him whom I serve. And what he is saying is this, that your thinking, your vision is limited to this world only. It does not extend beyond these material things of power, wealth and, and, and uh, women. I seek something greater, something higher. And you fail to appreciate that. Nor do you serve whom I serve. That you run after these things. You lie and cheat to get votes to become the Prime Minister or the President. You lie and cheat to earn uh, an extra pound of profit for whatever it is that you are uh, um, uh, selling. The list is endless. So basically you are not serving God. You are not seeking God. You are seeking this world and its things. And then the Holy Prophet says, nor shall I serve that which you serve, that I will not be detracted from the path that I follow and that is to seek the Almighty, to seek nearness to God, to be close to Allah in this world and in the hereafter. And if I am to do that, then I cannot run after these things that you are offering me and you are saying, you know, stop your message of uh, pronouncing that there is only one God and that men should serve him and they should serve uh, the rest of humanity. Nor do you serve him whom I serve, for you is your recompense and for me is mine. So he says, well, fine. I'm not going to run after this world. I have a higher objective in mind. You can't do that because you can't see beyond the things of this world. So you're going to run after money and women and power and so on. And he says, fine, okay. You do what you want to do. I will do what I want to do. And let us see who will be successful. And again, when Islam talks about success, when Islam talks about achievements, Islam is not talking about things of this world. Islam is not talking about whether you win the election to become the president or how much money and limousines and uh, um, finery in your homes do you have. Islam, when it measures success, is talking about how spiritually elevated you become. When Islam talks about success, it, it means how much have you served the divine being. When Islam talks about success, it's talking about how much you've served the rest of humanity and done something for their benefit. This is achievement and success in Islam. And then we carry on with the next chapter, Surah Nasr, the help. And God tells us, when Allah's, uh, uh, when Allah's help and victory comes, you will see men entering religion of Allah in companies. 
celebrate the praise of thy Lord and ask for his protection. Surely he is ever returning to mercy. So God, this is a prophecy. And this is, you see, last chapter ends with, you seek whatever you want, I'll seek whatever I want. And then the next chapter tells the Holy Prophet Muhammad, it tells Muslims, if they seek the Almighty, if they seek the hereafter, what they will achieve. If they do that, then Allah will help them and they will be successful. Again, victory here does not mean that you will conquer Washington DC or your armies will, will march into uh, Moscow or Peking or wherever else, New Delhi or, or whatever. It means that you will be successful and people will see that and they will come and join you. And then the last verse is a warning to us because what happens when one people are successful or one people are victorious over another? They start dictating terms to them. And we see this all the time. We've seen this in recent events that have uh, taken place in various countries and we saw that in the First World War when Germans were defeated then the Allies, they started to dictate terms to them. You will do this, you will do that, you, you will pay uh, compensation for the war. The list is a long one. And God says, but what a Muslim should do is this. He should give thanks to Allah. For sabbi bihamdi rabbika. Celebrate the praise of thy Lord. Glorify God that he made you successful. And ask for his protection. Because you cannot, a Muslim cannot achieve anything. He cannot achieve that initial success without God's help that Allah talked about in the first verse. And that help and that success will not continue unless a Muslim carries on celebrating Allah's praise and asking for his help and his mercy. And we have many examples uh, which illustrate this. For example, uh, Hazrat Umar, when uh, he was attacked by an assassin and he knew his time was near, people went to him and he was crying. And they said, O Amirul Mu'mineen, why are you crying? Under you, Islam has advanced so much. We were restricted to this small peninsula. And now we have conquered Egypt, what is now Israel and Jordan and uh, Syria and, and Lebanon. And uh, it has become a vast empire. So surely Allah will be pleased with you. And Hazrat Umar said, when I look over my life, and I compare the mistakes I have made with the right things or good things that I have achieved or done. I will be lucky if God decides to overlook my shortcomings. So this is a man like Umar, right towards the end, having achieved a great many things for Islam. He was the first person who, after embracing Islam, said, we will not pray hiding in our homes. He took out his sword and he asked the Muslims to march behind him to Hana Kaaba. And he stood over them, guarding the Holy Prophet as they prayed in public. Such was his esteem even after he had embraced Islam. That because that one man was standing guard over the Holy Prophet and Muslims, no one would dare come near them, let alone touch them. And he is doing this. He is celebrating the praise of his Lord and asking forgiveness and his protection right at the end of his life, having achieved so much. And then the Holy Quran compares it with those people who depend on power and wealth in this world. 
then that chapter is called Surah Lahab, the flame. Abu Lahab's hands will perish and he will perish. His wealth and that which he earns will not avail him. He will burn in fire giving rise to flames. This goes back to Surah al kafirun This is what happens to those people who are given the abundance and, he use, and they use that abundance to spiritually develop themselves and what they will attain in this world and the next. Surah Lahab goes back to Surah al kafirun and that says <coughs> what happens to people who depend on means of this world only. And that's the important thing to remember. Means of this world only. God does not forbid us from using things or resources of, uh, of this world. And the important thing, the important verse to note is the middle one. His wealth will not avail. See, in this world, we say, I mustn't annoy this one, he is a rich person. I might need him. But God says you don't need anyone. Because this money that he has, this, these assets that he has, this wealth that he has, that is not going to save him, let alone you. So why are you running after him? If the master of those assets cannot save his own soul, how is he going to save you? And if you carry on, the next chapter is Surah Ikhlas, the unity. Allah is he on whom depend all. So that's the connection between that one. This man is depending on his wealth and that will not achieve anything for him. If he does the wrong thing, he will burn. But God is one. And if you depend on him and if you call on him, then you will, you will achieve that success that the Holy Quran was talking about in uh, Surah Nasr. So when we think of a sequence in the chapters of the Holy Quran, we must keep in mind what the objective of the Holy Quran is. And the objective of the Holy Quran is to guide humanity. And these last few verses, these last few chapters of the Holy Quran are like summarizing and comparing two sets of people. One, those who solely depend on things of this world and things of this world impress them. And they run to curry favor with those people who are powerful or those people who are wealthy or they have something else. And it compares that group with the other group that depends solely on help from God. And it then compares what happens at the end to each one of those. So we must keep this in mind that the Holy Quran is a, is a book of guidance. And when we go from one chapter to the next, we should try to think what the connection and the link is between those two chapters.